Hello and welcome to the free online woodworking school. On this channel we normally do long form series based on hand tool woodworking making various woodworking projects. But in this video we're going to be doing something slightly different. Stabilizing timber. And I wanted to take this opportunity to walk you through the entire process showing you how to do it, what sort of equipment you need and more importantly what sort of result you can expect to get at the end of it. Let's begin with that last one. This is a set of very dirty scales, don't judge me, and here's a piece of wood that's sitting at about 35 grams. But here is a piece of wood that's been stabilized. Exactly the same tree, ignore the color for the time being, but with a massive weight increase. But instead of just giving you a one-off example, I'm gonna go through this entire pile of curly maple, weigh every block individually. We'll get the average of this entire batch, and then at the end of the process, we'll measure them all again, see what sort of weight increase we got, and see also what these are gonna look like. And honestly, I am so excited about this. This is luthier grade curly maple, which is is like among the best you can get. This material was destined to be like a carved guitar top and I think the timber supplier would be mortified to know that I've cut it all up into blanks like this, but trust me, it'll be worth it, hopefully. Anyway, I'm gonna get weighing these one by one and we'll write the weight on the timber, get the average and go from there. Okay, so the average is 35.65 grams across this whole range. This is the 35 pile, that's the 36, so it's pretty much bang on. So 35.65 is the average weight of the blank as it is before stabilization. However, before we get to the stabilizing process, we actually need to make them lighter because within this wood is a load of water and the stabilizing resin doesn't like it when the material you're stabilizing still has water in it. And so what we need to do is dry these blanks to remove all that water and preferably get them down to about 0% moisture content before then replacing that area that was previously filled with water with resin instead. And so how do you dry the timber you may ask? Well, I'm gonna be doing it in this, which is just a normal domestic oven that I've purchased specifically for this purpose, because we can use this for both drying the wood and also curing the stabilizing resin, which we'll talk about later. You could technically dry the wood in your oven at home, but you definitely don't wanna be curing the stabilizing resin in it because, um, hooey, naughty stuff. This stuff's a bit whiffy. I shouldn't be hanging around in it too long. And so as for the temperature of this oven, I've got it set just a hair over 100 degrees Celsius. 100 degrees Celsius is the boiling point of water. And so technically, if we get the piece of wood to that temperature uniformly, all of the water within will evaporate and um, just off I guess and so depending on the size of the blank this can take a while for small pen blanks like we're using it can be a matter of a few hours for much bigger blocks you might need to leave it in there all day and maybe even dry it in separate stages but what's more important than the temperature itself is making sure that whatever device you're using to read the temperature is accurate as you can see I've got a little temperature gauge in here and that is currently reading pretty much 100 degrees bang on. It's kind of fluctuating a little bit, but that's the sort of minimum temperature. However, if we go up here, there you go, it's just started messing around again. You can see my dial set to, it's close to 120 degrees. And so if I'd just blindly gone ahead and trusted this dial on top, chances are we would have never have got this oven up to the right temperature and we would have really struggled to dry the timber properly. So getting one of these little thermometer temperature devicey things inside the oven can be a really good way of accurately checking your temperatures. And so with that preheated sitting at about 100 degrees, we're now going to load it up with the blanks. Now 100 degrees is just about sort of manageable with your hands without burning yourself too bad. I wouldn't advise doing it, but I've got away with it so far. And we're just gonna make sure that when we put this in, all of these blanks have a little bit of a gap between them, just to allow airflow around the entire thing. So that is the, ah, that is the last of them. Temperatures drop significantly, but we'll just let that get back up to temperature again. And, um, revisit them in a moment. Now you might be wondering how you check if these blanks are actually dry or not. The first port of call for a lot of people would be, well, I'll just get a moisture meter on it. With moisture meters, effectively what they do is you put two prongs into a piece of wood. It sends a electrical signal through the piece of wood and it measures the resistance of that electrical current. And it uses that measurement to calculate what percentage of the wood is water. 
The problem with these moisture meters is they don't work below a certain moisture content because in order to measure something, they need to be able to send a current through it. And as the wood gets closer and closer to being completely dry, that signal gets weaker and weaker and it's not actually able to carry whatsoever. And so you're kind of blind in those last few um, percentages, I guess. And so the way we're going to do it is every hour or so, we're going to take five or so of those samples out of the oven and simply put them back on these scales that I measured them with originally. Because when the water starts evaporating in these blanks, they're gonna lose weight. And what we can do is every hour we'll measure them. And when they stop losing weight, we know that all the water's gone. And so I tend to be quite like overly generous with the amount of time that the blanks are in the oven because doing them for longer than they need to, it's not like it's not like it's gonna turn into an inferno in there. They're just gonna be very dry. Obviously, if you were doing this for a business, you wanna be kind of economical with the amount of electric you're using. But for me, I'm doing this in small batches here and there. I absolutely ram that oven full of blanks. And so even if I were to spend more on the electrical cost for running it longer than I needed to, the amount of timber in there should make up for that deficit. And also I can be absolutely certain that they are bone dry and perfect for stabilizing. And so we will come back in an hour or so and see where we're at. Right, so it has been one hour. So we'll take them out and check to see our progress. So this one was 36 and is now 33. So we've lost three grams on that. It's actually showing 32 now, I've just put it back. So I've just written that on the piece of wood. We'll get some samples sort of across the board just to make sure that we've got a few representations. So 37 down to 34 and this one 36 down to 33. So we've lost three grams across the board. So we will check them again in another hour's time, see if they've lost weight again. And if they have, then we'll put them back in the oven. But if they haven't lost any weight, what we'll do is we'll just sort of like you know assume that we're approaching the dryness that we need but probably keep them in the oven for an extra hour just to be sure this kind of first stage where we've lost three grams in just an hour that's the sort of fast bit right we're actually at about two hours later now because i forgot um <laughs> so let's have a look this one at the front 32 is now at 30. This one, 33, is now at 32. And let's see, this one, 33, is also at 31. We'll do a few more. 34, down to 33, 33, 31. So in two hours, we've lost two grams, whereas in the first hour, we lost two grams. And so we're losing water at about half the speed at the moment. We'll come back in an hour or so and see if those have changed. Right, here we are again, another two hours later, because once again, I forgot. 33 grams to 33 grams. So that one has not moved. After two hours, 30 grams, 30 grams. Yes. Let's see, we've got a 31 here. Well, that's now 32, so <laughs> probably my dodgy scales. And one for luck, 32, 31. 30. 30. We'll, we'll, we'll call that dry. So now that these blanks are dry, they're ready to be stabilized. The problem is the resin is cured by heat. And so if we submerge these in the resin in their current state, because these things are sitting at about 100 degrees, it's just gonna cure the resin around it and it's not gonna get a chance to be properly stabilized. So what we need to do is take this out of the oven and give it time to cool down. But we need to make sure that moisture cannot reach the wood while it's cooling down. For that, I've just got a bunch of these Ziploc sandwich bags and I'll stuff it full of as many blanks as I can, zip it up, and then we'll put that in a second box that's got a kind of rubber seal around the lid to help further prevent moisture from getting to that piece of wood. Because this is now at 0% moisture, wood is basically like a sponge for all the water molecules in the air. And so if we just leave it as is, it's just gonna soak up all of that water and get back to where we started six hours ago or however long it was. So here we go. Let's get them bagged up. So while those are cooling down, I thought I'd show you exactly what's just happened. We had 63 blanks in there and each of them lost about five grams in terms of water weight. That equates to 315 grams. This is what 315 grams of water looks like. Okay. 
fast. I mean, that's 316 there. All of that was in those curly maple blanks and is now just evaporated away and can be replaced with resin. Pretty cool, isn't it? And the thing with wood as well is that no matter how long you just leave it out, it will never get down to 0% moisture content by itself. It needs to be in those really high temperatures in order to lose all of that moisture. Just double checking before I sort of quote a inaccurate stat. Roughly six to eight percent moisture content is what you'd usually find in the wood that I sort of use in this workshop for my fine furniture. For exterior grade furniture, it might be a bit higher, maybe 12 or 14 percent. But yeah, when you hold a piece of wood, a significant portion of that is just water that you're holding. I always find that very fascinating. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow when those blanks cool down and we'll start the stabilization process. Right. So the blanks have all cooled off and so we can now start the stabilization process. For this, I am going to be using cactus juice stabilizing resin. I got this from House of Resin, who is a supplier of stabilizing resin, dyes, all sorts of craft accessories. And in a previous process, I've already gone ahead and dyed it red. When you purchase it, you get a little activator pot. You'll need to pour that into the resin. And sometimes not all of the activator comes out. So what you'll find is pouring a little bit of the resin into the activator pot, give it a shake, and then you can pour the rest of it in to make sure that you get the right ratios. And then as for the dyes, you just pour in however much you want. In my experience, experience, I would recommend going a lot darker than you think you should be, because as you'll see later in the process, when they come out the stabilizing chamber, they will look almost black and you'll think you've overdone it. But by the time it's cooked off, it lightens off and it pretty much comes back to the color you sort of see around the top here. So that covers the resin aspect of it. We've also got this, which is a stabilizing chamber, and this is what's going to suck all of the air out. Well, I guess the pump's going to suck all of the air out. This is going to be the vessel in order to do so. And again, this is made by Cactus Juice, the same company as the stabilizing resin. It's very important to get a decent quality stabilizing chamber when doing this, because with cheaper quality chambers, this resin can react with it and actually cause cracking and all sorts of things you don't want to happen when you've got a um, thing that could implode full of red resin. <laughs> so if you're going for this setup, I would highly recommend getting a stabilizing chamber from Cactus Juice. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, thin, tall, whatever. But so far for me, this has been the perfect size. So I'll put links to everything in the description below. Let's get it loaded up with blanks. So I'd recommend getting a pair of kitchen gloves for this because while I haven't found any like problems with this resin contacting skin, when you get it in a cut, it is quite possibly one of the worst burning pains you will ever experience. So um, yeah, and as a woodworker, I tend to get very small cuts on my hands that I never notice. So what I've just pulled out here is basically a, I don't know what you call it, like a clamp or something. Basically it goes in the pot and you can sort of twist it round and find an orientation in which it locks in this tube because these are not perfectly round. They're actually somewhat elliptical. So if you spin it round, you'll find a point in which it becomes kind of tight. That's going to be what holds the blanks down and prevents them from floating in the resin because when we're stabilizing we want them to be submerged the entire time so we'll take that out and get our blanks out of the sandwich bags one thing you can do with these bags to check that you've kept zero percent moisture content is after you've taken them out the oven weigh the entire bag and write the weight of it on the front that way a couple of days later when it comes to doing the stabilizing process you can just weigh the entire bag and check that it's the same weight as before rather than take out an individual blank and weigh them each time I haven't done so in this process because I've actually done this enough now to feel pretty confident. So now we will get the clamp in and I like to do this slightly above the blanks because that way they can float up a little bit and resin can get to the end grain underneath. If you just mush it down from above, then you're kind of choking the um, wood pores at the bottom and it's going to be a bit harder for resin to get in. In my mind anyway, that's not in the um, instructions. So right about there and then simply get your resin and pour it over. Watch out for splashing. And what we want to do here is fill it up so the resin is at least, I think the instructions say an inch above, but with this many blanks in here, I tend to do a little bit more because these will soak up a lot once we release the vacuum. So you can see in that sort of black abyss, it looks like we might have overdone it on the red, but trust me, it will come out in the wash later or in the oven, I should say. So before we put the lid on, let's give the rim a little bit of a wipe to make sure we get a good seal and then put the lid on. 
So the pump we're using for this is a two-stage vacuum pump. It just basically means that it can pull a deeper vacuum. When buying a vacuum pump like this, you don't actually have to worry about the CFM on it, which is the cubic foot per minute, I believe, that it's able to remove from a space. In this case, effectively, the only thing a higher CFM will achieve is getting this thing down to vacuum quicker, which, as you'll see in a minute, really isn't an issue. This does it within a few seconds. So don't worry too much about the CFM. This one is a 4.2. What matters the most is that you get a good quality pump that you feel confident can run for a long period of time. And of course, one that is able to pull a good quality vacuum. And so having a two stage vacuum pump is sort of preferable for that. So let's get it attached. So when you purchase this chamber, it comes with this shutoff valve fitted because that's the one that we're going to use to close off the air and start generating the vacuum. This one, myself and my friend James added afterwards because it basically allows you to close that, disconnect the pump and keep a vacuum in here. But it's not recommended to do because if you pull a vacuum in this, shut this off and disconnect the pump, the vacuum will be there temporarily. But as the vacuum above the blanks continues to pull air out of them, that air from the wood is going to repressurize this area above. And so so it's going to pull less air out and that just becomes a circulating process to the point where it just reaches equilibrium inside. And so really you need to have a pump connected the entire time to make sure that you're continuously pulling air out of this area. Thus that's pulling air out of the blanks and it's able to get fully removed from the chamber. So we'll open this valve get this connected, just a quick release fitting, and then turn on the pump. It's actually recommended to keep the pumps away from the chamber. So that's turned on. And what we can do here is slowly close this valve. You might find it doesn't do anything. So that valve is now completely closed, but it's not actually removing any air. You can see that the dial isn't moving. All you need to do with this is just put a bit of pressure on the lid, but be careful because this will foam up slightly when you do so. And we don't want it being sucked out of the tube. When it starts foaming up, just open the valve slightly and you'll find that that will depress the bubbles. There we go, you see the dial climbing. There's the bubbles. Open the valve. Just a small amount. Close it. And you just gotta do this for a minute or so until the bubbles stabilize. So it's already slowing down. We're still rising in pressure up here. The bubbles are still climbing. It's looking pretty stable now. I'll just introduce air once more. And then close it off. That should be absolutely fine now. The stuff I'm using here is actually a new formula from Cactus Juice. Well, somewhat new, because the first iteration they had of this stuff used to foam really badly and it would take ages to go through that process. Whereas now just a minute or so was all it took to kind of stabilize those bubbles. And so when you purchase this stuff, just know that you're getting the new formula, which won't cause um, much of those foaming issues. So now it's just a case of leaving this for a few hours, let these bubbles kind of settle down a bit and then we'll reassess whether it's worth introducing pressure or leave it a little bit longer. Personally, I would recommend not leaving this overnight or unsupervised. Leaving a pump running unattended, even with thermal cutoff switches and stuff, just, I don't know, makes me feel a bit weird. So I wouldn't recommend it, but leave that up to you. But yeah, we'll come back in a couple of hours. Just make sure that this is nice and safe. It's not gonna get hit or tipped because it will implode if knocked significantly or falls off a bench. And that would be quite the mess to clear up. So occasionally with pen blanks, they slip through the grate like this. You can see it's just poking up. That one isn't gonna stabilize correctly now because when I introduce air, it's, yeah, it's just not gonna go through the full process. So I'll take note of that one when we repressurize it. Um, and maybe send it through with these other ones that I've still got remaining. So currently we've got negative pressure in the chamber. All of the positive pressure, or I should say neutral pressure of the current air is pushing on the outside of the chamber. It's not actually reaching the blanks yet. So what we're gonna do is slowly, very slowly open the valve here, which is gonna add pressure to the area above the blanks. And then that pressure is gonna to want to get into the blanks which are submerged below. In doing so, it's gonna force all of that resin down into it. So that's why it's very important to leave these soaking in the resin after removing the pressure. Because if I just put pressure in and take it out straight away, I haven't actually given time to let the resin be pushed in. So I've got a bit of tape here. We will just put this at the height of the resin, roughly there, and introduce pressure. 
very slowly. So yeah, you can see that the tank, the pump did absolutely nothing until now. That is now pushing resin into the blanks. We can turn that off. We can remove the lid. This blank on top is useless because it's now been pressurized from above, like all this stuff below, it's like rubbish. So we'll just take that out. And these now, we'll come back to it and um, see how far that drops. I might even top the resin up a little bit because I'm a bit concerned how quick that's gone down. <laughs> we'll retop it up to there. That was the sort of initial push you saw. I'll leave it for, I don't know, probably till the end of the day and we'll see where that goes down to now. Very cool, innit? <laughs> No, it's like extra weight. Okay, so these have been in here for probably four to five hours now by this point. And as you can see, it has dropped another inch. On top of that, you might be able to see it, but all of the blanks have actually dropped and they're no longer floating in the resin. You might remember earlier, I put the grate sort of slightly above the blanks so that they would float up to it, therefore giving a bit of space underneath. Not only in my mind does this give a little bit more sort of area for the air to escape the blanks, but also from a satisfaction point of view, being able to watch those blanks just drop one by one, super satisfying. So by this point, I am pretty certain that it's not going to drop any further than that. A good rule of thumb with this is to leave them soaking in the resin for twice as long as you were vacuuming. So I did about two hours of vacuuming the pressure out of this. I left it for about four to five in terms of soaking. And so now we can take them out. We'll let them drip dry a little bit and then we'll get them in the oven. Interestingly, there is one that's still floating in there. You do get this with some woods occasionally. Some stabilize better than others, and there is gonna be variation within timbers themselves, but all of them except this one are just sinking straight to the bottom. I might even put that one aside and just see if I can restabilize it, seeing as it's a bit of a anomaly. Okay, and then the beautiful thing about cactus juice is that it can just be reused indefinitely. You just keep going with it until it all ends up in the wood. So I'm gonna get stabilizing another batch and we can put that dud back into it. And so now we're just creeping the oven up to 93 degrees, which it's pretty much sitting at now. 93 degrees is the curing temperature of cactus juice stabilizing resin. Any cooler than that and it's not going to harden. Any hotter than that and it will harden. But from my understanding, what it does is it makes the cactus juice very viscous and it, a lot of it just ends up leaking out onto the tray below. You're always going to get some amount of leak out when you do this, but clearly we want to keep that as minimal as possible. So getting this to as accurately 93 degrees as possible is very important. This is actually creeping up slightly above now. So I'm just going to drop that and we'll kind of fiddle with it when the blanks are in there. Now, when loading this up, make sure you leave a little bit of a gap between each of the blanks, because trust me, when they're touching and they dry, they really do stick together, and it can be quite difficult to um, pry them apart. Occasionally, you'll see people wrap these in foil when um, curing the resin. Honestly, I'm not sure what the purpose of this is, but I can tell you, you absolutely don't need to do it. I think it might have been an old practice, maybe before this resin came in. Don't take my word for that, but yeah, you don't need to do it in this case. Just load them in as they are, and it should be absolutely fine. Right, so it's been a fair few hours now, and these are about ready to take out the oven. So I'll just turn off the temperature. There's a couple of ways of knowing when they're done, but really it just comes down to both a little bit of experience and also just patience. There's no harm with leaving these in longer than you need to. It doesn't ruin the resin. It doesn't really do anything detrimental other than make sure that it's definitely stabilized through and through. So I always end up leaving things in there longer than expected, but really the main thing you're looking for is just to make sure it doesn't look wet on any of the faces still. There's gonna be sort of weird staining and things like that that happens and that's kind of inevitable but it will be turned away once we uh, start processing this but if things still look wet then clearly it's not going to be dry but yeah these are looking pretty good so we'll get the rest out and um, I guess start weighing them okay so now comes the moment of truth 
The original blank was 35 grams, and I think we had an average across the entire lot of about 35 and a half. Now we've got all of them stabilized, we're gonna get the average of this lot to find out what the average weight increase is gonna be. Now I have lost a few along the way just due to experimentation and um, misplacement, I guess. So let's get weighing them. Okay, so the total weight of all of these blanks is 3,028 grams. So 3,028 divided by 58 equals 52.2 grams. So I don't know the formula for working out a weight increase, but if we look at the original, and then we use this fancy calculator I've just found, up to 52.2, the answer is a 46.42% weight increase. That is pretty significant. Do you hear that? 46% increase. That's more than I thought, actually. So let's not forget as well, even when these are turned down, sure, they're gonna lose a lot of weight, but the finished product will still be 46.42% heavier than what it would be had it not been stabilized in the first place. So in terms of tools, not only is the weight an added benefit of this, but also stabilizing adds a ton of durability to these. Clearly we've been able to mess around and change the look of it as well. There's all sorts of reasons why this process is so good for tools, knives, whatever. Very impressed with that. So now I guess we should turn them down and see what's underneath this layer of uh, scabbing, I guess, on top. Oh, that is a disgusting word. It, we're gonna keep it. <laughs> Your mind really is the limit with this and what I've shown you here is just the basics to get you started. There's so many amazing effects you can create by varying the wood species you stabilize, let alone all the other materials such as bone, antler and even rock that you can use. You can also create amazing effects by double dyeing woods in primary and secondary colors or simply just use this process to add extra durability and weight to the items you want to make. If you want to try this process for yourself, the links to everything I used are in the description below. And once again, thank you very much to House of Resin for sponsoring this video. Even if you don't plan on stabilizing, you'll no doubt find something cool on their website, so be sure to check them out. Finally, if you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.